I'll tell you what, uh, I, I, I'm sure they could probably spend another hour just sharing and talking, and I know when the pastor says, hey, pick one thing, <laughs> there's a whole myriad of thoughts going through your mind, and uh, it's awesome. I mean, to, to, get, the, uh, to get the call uh, about what had happened and to, to go down to the burn center and to, uh, to be there, um, it's under warranty. Um, <laughs> To, to go in, here's, here's the thing, I mean, when you walk into an environment where, just before I went and saw you for the first time, Connor, there's a woman in waiting to get a bed, and the agony and the pain of someone, and she, and she looked like, uh, she didn't look like she had been burned, but she had been burned, and the crying out just for some sort of alleviation from the pain, and then walking in to see Connor totally wrapped in gauze, and it is a miracle that he's even standing up on the stage with his wife, declaring how good God is, and uh, it's pretty awesome. So, uh, yeah, Connor, I think that's it's great perspective. Whether God chooses to to heal or not to heal, He's still going to be glorified in in this situation, and to to accept that and to. Um, now I don't I don't have a I don't have an excuse when I do this. <laughs> I'm glad you explained that. I mean, because you've had grafts put on. Um, yeah, so my my arms are mostly made out of uh, my legs now. Yeah. <laughs> so they they harvested a lot of skin from my legs, so they're yeah. Incredibly itchy. Yeah, I bet, <laughs> I bet. Well, to walk alongside of you too, and Christina, just just that that importance of keeping the thoughts. Where they need, because the enemy would love to just sow seeds of just um, confusion and questioning, and not that you don't have questions, and not that you don't have anger, right? But to have those those things grounded, those feelings grounded. And the reason we bought a Connor a speaker is because I walked in on another visit to go see him, and all you heard was the nurses and the commotion. And I'm thinking to myself, man, to 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 not even be able to sleep and just hear this constant just noise. I said, Connor, would it be good just to like get your mind on like just dial on some podcasts? I I know the kind of preachers and teaching he likes and we made it happen because it's like even when you are in such a a cloistered environment and you have all this just maddening confusion, you need something. And so it's kind of the same for you, right? Like let those thoughts be taken captive by something positive. So boy, that, that quiet, I mean not quiet, but that confusion, the devil can work in that too. And you feel like you're going crazy as, as you testified to. And um, boy, I'm just so thankful how God is working. And he's going to continue to be glorified and magnified in your story and your lives. And um, it's amazing. So thanks for, for sharing a bit. And I'm sure they would love to chat more. So if you want to uh, grab some time with them and, and hear some more of their story, uh, that would be fantastic. So thanks, you guys, for being available. Luke uh, 13 is where we're going to be this morning, and it's always good to hear how God is working in our lives and to, to share testimony of how God is working and to testify to his good works. And uh, Luke 13 is where we're going to be. We're going to be looking at verses 10 through, through 21. So, um, so I had a, I had a difficult, my, my Friday was difficult. So my, uh, usually it's date day on Friday, but my wife chose to to do a sub teaching job, which left me on my own. And it just so happened that a last minute golf opening ended up. So, you know, these are the burdens I have to bear as your pastor. All right. So it was a fundraiser. Someone had paid my, my spot. And so I get to go play golf, which I haven't done in a long time. And, uh, and I just want you to know, it is a burden because there's a place in the Bible that says suffering leads to perseverance and perseverance leads to character building. That's my golf game summarized in a Bible verse. (laughs) right there. It's suffering, and if I persevere, then, then maybe there's some character stuff I, I learned through it. So uh, here's what I got to do. So I got to golf with, I don't know how many, there probably was like a 80 to 100 people out there golfing. Um, I, got, I got stuck with the Chick-fil-A team. Okay. Now, I want you to know this is awesome. So they're one of the sponsors. So I get stuck with the Chick-fil-A team, which means by the end of the day, I, I think I had feathers growing on me. I was eating so much Chick-fil-A, and I know some of you, that, that sounds like heaven, and I'm going to tell you, it was. So I'm hanging out with the Chick-fil-A crew. The, these are owner-operators, nicest guys in the world, right? And uh, so I'm hanging out with Chick-fil-A, and 
they introduced me to some other Chick-fil-A people. They're like, this is, this is Pastor Scott. And, and they're like, oh, wow. Like, I think I was maybe one of a few pastors out there, which sometimes you, you don't want the pastor thing to be out there, especially while you're golfing and there's suffering and perseverance and character building going on. But we, we come up to one of the holes, and it's a Chick-fil-A-sponsored hole, right? And they're, they're handing out free coupons for milkshakes and Chick-fil-A. And at that point, I've had enough. Uh, but I, I took them anyways because I got a family of five. Um, <laughs> So we're at this hole, right? And the, the lady who's passing all the, she's like, oh, come here. And she waves to her friend that's working with her. You got to meet Pastor Scott because aren't you looking for a new church to go to? And she's like, she comes up to me and we're just going to call her Catherine, right? For the sake of, of anonymity. So Catherine, she, she's like, oh, you're a pastor. She goes, um, she, she asked me an interesting question, which is usually not a question I get out, out of the gate when it comes to being a pastor. Do you preach on sin? And I said, well, that's an interesting question. I said, yeah, in a roundabout way. But she, this was like a big thing for her. Do you preach on sin? And uh, I said, well, that's, I said, why do you ask? Because usually I hear about, do you preach on grace? Or do you preach on love? Or you, but do you preach on sin? That was her thing. And I said, well, why do you ask? She says, because I've been part of a church for 20 years. And that's all they preach on. And I said, uh, and she put out the word, she put out this word cult. Even though it would be a Christian church, she described it as, a, and I said, why are you still there? Right? You're acknowledging that it's been 20 years of just preaching about sin, and if you would see it as a cult. She says, because the pastor continues to tell us that if we left the church, it would be against God's will. And I said, Catherine, you need to get out of there. <laughs> I said, what? You could just tell, like, she was stuck. She was stuck. Is that the, the, perhaps one of the worst nightmares you can imagine? The very place that we should associate with grace and freedom and liberation is the place where she is stuck. Because it's been taught to her time and time again that if you leave, it's sin. If you leave, it's a bad decision. If you leave, it is against God's will. And how long for someone to hear those words where there's, there's no out? We think of people that aren't going to church as the ones that are like stuck and in bondage and in sin. But there's people in the church that are stuck and they're in bondage and and there's a cry. See, if it wasn't a scramble and I had to hurry up and move along and they're still giving me free coupons for Chick-fil-A, I would have spent probably an hour talking to her. But they're like, Pastor Scott, it's time to go, right? Like, because there's other golfers waiting. But I'm like, Catherine, please, 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 here's my information. Reach out. Because there's something better for you. There is something better for you. And I'm thinking about that, and I'm going, boy, how many people are even in church, and it's a, it's a binding context, and it's not a liberating context. There's people here right now that do not yet know the freedom that comes through knowing Jesus Christ. Why? Because we have this, this uncanny ability as human beings to to put one another in, in chains and shackles and bondage. And that is not a good thing. This is, the gospel is not a gospel of bondage. It is a gospel of freedom. Right? The, if there is no, there is no freedom where there is no grace. Tweet moment of the morning. Write that down. There is no freedom where there is no grace. And there's one thing I know about the the. the the God that I, I, I worship and I adore and I teach about is this. He is a God of infinite grace. And the more you walk in light of his grace, the more freedom you will discover. The, the, the message this morning is exactly about this. You need to be reminded of how God works, how God heals, how God delivers, how God shows forth his grace continually because you can't get Romans 5.20 out of your head, right? It is this, where your sin abounds, his grace abounds all the more. 
Quit sticking in environments that preach on sin and not grace. Quit having relationships with people who continually point out sin and are not gracious to you. We are designed for something better. So this morning, we're going to hear about the grace of God given to us, and we're going to talk about the grace of God shared with others. Because I'm tired of talking to people who don't help other people out when it comes to the burdens and the difficulties. I know the struggles I have. Now to have someone alongside of me that adds to those, I don't want those kind of relationships. That's not the gospel. And so I pray for people like Catherine. I pray for our time together this morning that we would hear a message today about, about freedom because that's exactly what the gospel brings. Luke chapter 13, check this out. Great, great section of, of scripture here. Luke uh, 13, verse 10. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Now you're going to see in a moment why that one verse is so important. He's teaching in a synagogue on the Sabbath. And behold, there's a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double over and could not straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid hands upon her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. And the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the multitude in response, there are six days in which work should be done, therefore come during those days and get healed, not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie or loosen your ox or your donkey from the stall and lead them away to water to, to give them water to drink? Here is a woman, a daughter of Abraham, as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day. And he said this, and all his opponents were being humiliated. And the entire multitude was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by Jesus. And therefore he says to them, What is the kingdom of God like, and to what shall I compare it? It's like a mustard seed, which a man took, throws into his garden, and grew, and it becomes his tree, and the birds of the air nest in its branches. And again, he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman takes and hides in three pecks of meal until it is all leavened. May God write his eternal truths on our hearts this morning. So the kingdom of God is breaking in to this scene in Luke 13. And the kingdom of God is breaking into our world today. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? The kingdom of God is always working in our world. And this is important because God's kingdom work is a perfect work. God's kingdom work is a work that takes place on seven days during the week, not just six days. And of any day, it needs to work. It needs to work on the Sabbath day, the day that is reserved for us to rest and be restored. That's why the Sabbath was created, right? Man was not created for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was created for man. Because he says, you need a day to just stop and be who you are. This, is, this life is not about what you do, it's about who you are. And there's been a day reserved for you by God that says, this is the day you find rest and this is the day you are stored. That's why verse, verse 10 is important. Look at Jesus' teaching in a synagogue, unknown, unnamed synagogue, some location that's not important, but it's a synagogue, and it's on the Sabbath, right? This is all important because as, as these synagogues were small little gathering places, there were hundreds of them all around Palestine, and Jesus just happened to be the speaker this day at the synagogue. Lucky him or lucky them, I don't know, but here he is teaching, and... This would be the last time 
in Luke's gospel that we have this recorded ministry in a synagogue. The place that you don't think the gospel needs to be shared, this is probably the, the, the most ideal place the gospel needs to be shared. Just like the church. We come and, and I think we think we're okay, and we're not. If there's a place that where go the gospel needs to be shared, it's in church. If there's a place where grace needs to be shared and, and experienced, it's in church. And so Jesus picks the perfect place on the perfect day to showcase his perfect work, right? This is no accident. So here he comes, and, and the first point we're going to look at is this. There's a liberated healing that takes place, a liberating healing. And I believe the same God that healed this woman who had been bent over with a severe medical condition. We don't know specifically what it is, but we, it, but we don't need to haggle over it because for, for 18 years, this is the woman's posture. Like, can you imagine shuffling about? Like, you're not being able to look up. I mean, you're, you, she has a forced posture of humility for 18 years. And people knew her. They called her names. Here comes the hunchback. Here comes whoever, right? Like, she couldn't stand up. This was her, and, and we don't know how long she had had this, uh, how old she was when she first got this condition. Jesus says there was some sort of demonic influence upon her life at one time but here she is she's just she's walking around right for 18 years i mean i get a little sore ache for 18 seconds in my back and i start whining and crying and complaining amen anybody else with me on that one let's be honest men when they get sick we're babies 18 years i wonder how many tears had been collected in god's bottle from from the cries of this woman psalm 56 he collects our tears in a, in a little vial. I wonder how many, how many prayers filled the bowl of incense with Revelation chapter 5 talks about the bowl of the cries of the saints that God, he, he recognizes, he hears. Here's this woman, right, crying and praying. 18 years of suffering, perhaps a slow build of chronic pain. Just physically, it, it begins to wear on your soul. Any of you who have had chronic physical pain, it has a, it has a, a, a way of seeping into your, your mental, emotional, spiritual state. And here she'd suffer the loss of capacities. Maybe she had a passion to, to, to cook. Maybe she had a passion to build things. Who knows? But, but now it's greatly hampered and hindered by her condition. And not just her own limitations, right, that she's, she's haunted by. She is hearing probably the criticisms, right? The, the indignities that we sometimes heap upon p pity where, where they pity her or they're disgusted by her, right? And, and like last week we talked about the people that were killed by Pilate or the people that the tower fell on, right? Perhaps they're this message of, well, she's suffering God's divine judgment. The reason you're like that is because you, there must be some sin that's not confessed in your heart. But all I know is for 18 years and probably longer, there's something about her that continues to shuffle to the synagogue. There's something about her who, that says, no matter what my condition may be on the, on the outside, if I don't keep my soul pointed upward, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna die. Even Jesus, right? He says, this is a woman that somehow evil has had its its work but she's devout she's 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 pious in a, in a good way right she she wants to to honor god and i'm sure this the synagogue she went to she was a regular at but at that synagogue she she found no healing much less sympathy but she still went right there's there's something about the fact that it may be the last place you want to go to, but, but you need to go, right? I think about this context, right? Like sometimes we may be suffering through something and we, that's the last place we want to go to. I talk to people all the time. They, they say it straight to my face. Like, I, I don't think I'm going to make it to church tomorrow. And there's part of me like the very place you're, you don't want to go to is the very place you need to go to. 
right? And so this woman decides to go. And I'll tell you what, here's, here's what the enemy wants to do. And I do need a Kleenex. My wife's bringing me a Kleenex. <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's gravity. Here's, here's what the enemy wants to do. Whether See, this is a vivid metaphor going on right here. Because I don't think anyone walked in this morning physically looking like this. But I think it's a metaphor because I know people walked in and their, their spirits are, are double bent over. Their souls are double bent over. Matter of fact, sometimes we overcorrect physically to compensate for what, if anyone knew about what was going on inside of me, they would, they would sneer at me. They would maybe have false pity towards me. They would maybe think, boy, you're under God's divine du- judgment for something, right? You may be standing like this, but inside, emotionally, you are bent over. And God wants to bring a liberating healing to you because like Connor and Christina had said earlier, you got to take your thoughts captive. Because here's one thing I know that the enemy would love to do. He wants to continue to break down your dignity. He wants to break down the design in which God had created you to, to be, and that is from the inside out first. You may be suffering something physically, but I'll tell you what, if you don't wrestle with your heart and, and come to that place where you realize that, like Connor had said, right, if he chooses to heal me and straighten me up, that's up to him. But no matter what, I'm not going to allow the enemy to, to, to dictate my dignity. I'm going to let God remind me I'm still a creature created in his image. I'm still the apex of God's creation. I'm still the one that Jesus loves. I'm still the one that is relational and rational and spiritual and moral and, and ethical and all those things that make us unlike any other parts of God's creation, right? Right? The one thing you can't do is hear a voice from God, which is not his voice. It's the voice of the enemy that says, you're wretched. You're undeserving. You're guilty. You had everything that was coming from you, given to you. You know, you don't need that. This is a woman who went to the very place where you would have thought she would have received help. But she came on a day when she did get help. Maybe she heard Jesus was going to be there and thought, This is my only hope. This is my only hope. But I think she was probably the type of woman who said, even if God doesn't heal me, I'm still going to be okay with that. How many of you are bent over, feeling the weight of moral and spiritual burdens? (laughs) I rarely blow my nose like that. (laughs) But that's real. That's real right there. (laughs) See, here's what I know the fall. Write down the fall. Genesis 3. Right? The the moment God says, you know, you've disobeyed me, but I'm still going to be gracious to you, but you're going to have to suffer the consequences of your disobedience. The the enemy is is part and parcel of, from the very beginning, here's what the enemy does. The enemy does not build you up. The enemy wants to continue to tear you down. Here's what I know. The, the enemy is a master of robbing humanity of its dominion, its dignity, it, and it degrades people into, into emotional, spiritual, mental, physical slaves. Right? It just, it just beats, it beats, he beats. And here Jesus takes the initiative. He's teaching. And here's the woman. And he doesn't even know her name. Woman! Look at, I love it, verse, verse 12. Woman, you are freed from your sickness. Like nothing was more important. Like he could have been on the best point in his sermon. And he felt like, nope, what's more important is this woman who is going to have the work of God displayed in her body right here, right now. Think about this. He takes the initiative and he says, she must be loose. This is a strong, strong word. 18 years of misery 
were instantaneously healed by Jesus. This is something you need to understand when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you hear Jesus say, you're saved, you're redeemed, you're delivered, I know there's three things to be true of that. It is complete, it is instantaneous, and it is permanent. When Jesus says you are saved, you are delivered, you're redeemed, there's three things that are true of that salvation. It is complete, it is instantaneous, and it is permanent. Complete, instantaneous, per permanent. There's nothing you lack when you have Christ. Christ. There's nothing that God hasn't done at the moment you believed that you're missing out on. And you'll never lose the grace and mercy and kindness and compassion of God. It's permanent. And it happens like that. What the enemy had been doing for 18 years is instantaneously undone by Christ. Yes. It is instantaneous. But what this woman and all of us who have experienced the grace of God have to understand is that now begins a journey of learning and, and unlearning and relearning things that have to do with our dignity and how we're created in the image of God. But I'll tell you what, if you have Jesus, you lack nothing. You have everything. And nothing can change that position with God through Christ Jesus. Jesus sees us in our deepest need, even more significantly, in, in our deepest inward deformities. God sees us. That's why I, years ago I preached a message, and I tell people jokingly, I'm not responsible for anything I said five minutes ago. But years ago I preached a message, and I said, who's the most important person in the church? Who's the most important person in the church outside of Jesus? You, everyone gets an A. Who said Jesus? You get an A. I tell you, if you go to Bible school or, or seminary, if you go with glory of God or Jesus Christ, you're going to get an A every time. But the most important person at, at the church is not the pastor. It's not the person that makes your coffee. Praise God for the baristas. <laughs> the most important person at any church at any moment is the person who is the most hurt and the most burdened. Galatians talks about this. If we don't recognize, it's just like the, the, the pail that you fill with water, the pail can only hold as much water as the shortest or weakest you know, flat is able to, to, to hold. What we need to recognize is that there are people burdened. And the person that needs the most love and the most grace and the most kindness at any given time we gather is the person who's struggling the most. That's the most important person in the church but we're all programmed differently, aren't we? It's the pastor, it's the leaders, it's the, it's the, you know, the guy playing guitar and shredding it up, or the singer, ah, you know, it's like, yeah! No. It's the person who's by themselves in the corner where they're just being bathed in shame and guilt and condemnation. Because Jesus will stop his sermon and call that person. This, this is a time for you. I could have the most epic points, but if there's a person hurting, things stop because that person's the most important person. So Jesus calls her out. And, and this is what I love. So here he is in the synagogue, right? There's, there's, there are hypocritical spiritual leaders all around at this moment. And what I love with him calling the woman out and instantaneously, completely, and permanently healing her is that it shows his utter indifference to their rank and status environment. He shows a total, utter indifference to their perception of privilege. Who deserves God's love and who doesn't? He shows an utter and complete indifference to their sense of achievement. And they're all walking around thinking they're the most religious guy on the block. And he just says, I have no love for your religious system that you've created because if you have a religious system that makes you feel good and you have not love for a person who's hurting that is a bankrupt religious system 
He will supersede their authority in an instant because God does not want you in your self-righteousness to miss out on loving people. He has no interest in anyone's self-righteousness. He has an interest in helping people who are double bent over because of their sin and their burden and their grief. So let's talk about this. Second point. So there's a liberating healing that takes place. This is the synagogue that, again, is unnamed. We don't know where it's located. We don't even know who the head Pharisee of the synagogue is. But there is a significant life-changing work going on in that place. And that's important to know. Sometimes it's the un insignificant, unnamed places where God works that it may not be on the, on, the, uh, on the cover of the latest Christian magazine. You may not be voted the, the top 10 growing church in the world, but I'll tell you what, it's the insignificant places where God loves to do his work. Like a place like this. But while there's a liberating healing going on, there's also a condemning hypocrisy that Jesus calls out. See, when God works, here's what's going to happen. It's going to put a smile on someone's face, but it usually also puts a scowl on someone else's face. <laughs> there are always going to be those people who are just like, they're just piss angry at God. Because they see you experiencing the joy of the Lord, but you, because you think you can achieve, you know, some sort of relationship with God through your self-righteousness, that will always put a scowl on your face. There's no joy in trying to follow God according to your own rules. So this is a great miracle that's taking place, but they would deem it, it was the wrong day. I mean, God, if you're going to work, work Monday through Saturday. Don't work on Sunday. Listen, listen to what the religious leader says, right? The ruler demanded that people get healed on the other six days as if he was there waiting to heal people all week. Right? Like, call me tomorrow, I'll be here, but there's no healing today. Wouldn't that be an interesting sign to put outside like on a Sunday morning? Like, just so you guys know, don't expect God to work today. Come on in. Let's just be happy in our own little religious circles. But there will be no work of God here today. <laughs> Tomorrow, come back. But this is his way, right, of, of covering up his own shallowness. If she'd only called me on Wednesday, I was here. Horrible theology. You want to know why this is horrible? Because if God would be willing to set her free to stand up straight, it certainly would be today. Like as if you can control and manage God to work according to when you want him to work. And the one day God's certainly not going to work is the Sabbath. Jesus, don't you know this? You claim to be the Lord of the Sabbath. Don't you know that there is a time when God works? I'm going to say right now, that's horrible theology. God can work when he wants, how he wants, and he can bring about whatever he wants. And don't you dare say the opposite. Don't you dare come to the table and go, you know, it's just not the right day. I'm going to tell you right now, it's always about the right dignity. You may say, it's not, it's not according to schedule, but it has everything to do with someone's significance. You may say, you know what, it's just a hindrance right now. No, no, no. You are gladly hindered when it has to do with hope. Talk about a joy killer. This guy, this is not the guy you want to invite to the party and think, hey, it's going to be fun. Dave the Pharisee, sorry Dave, there's, there's a Dave here, I just picked a random name. Legalism, legalism always smothers spontaneity. The Spirit of God works when and how it needs to work. The moment you tell me God can't do something, or certainly not here or today or tomorrow, the moment legalism creeps into our attitudes is the moment it will squash spontaneity. I believe God is living and active right here, right now. Just like Revelation says, it says Christ is walking among the, the lampstands of his churches. He is here walking among us. And may we be ready to, to expect God to work. Someone once said, if we truly believe that God was living and active right here, right now, we would put our seatbelts on in our chairs and be wearing construction hard hats because we don't know when this God's going to come up, work and start doing some really cool construction on us. Right? But do we really believe? 
right, do we really believe? Or is it a God who's fashioned after your own image? Unless you plan it, unless you regulate it, uh, God's not going to work. So that's what this guy, he was mad at Jesus, but he doesn't talk to Jesus. This is how much of a coward he is, right? He addresses the audience. He doesn't even address Jesus. He's like, listen, folks, you guys know any other day is good, but not today because me being the leader of the synagogue, I haven't planned it. I haven't regulated it. Therefore, God's not going to work. Legalism, which always results in hypocrisy, will always value rules over relationship. Always. And he says, you hypocrites. Why? Because you're being selective, you're being self-centered, you're being hypocritical because this woman who has been loosed from her bondage by the hand of God, you won't even stop to celebrate. He's indignant. He's not joyful. He's indignant that God worked. And he says, this woman who was loose, you guys go loose your donkeys. Notice the word. You'll go and untie your donkey, which on the Sabbath, right, you're going to go take an animal to go give him water. You're going to loose that animal to do this. How much more is this woman who's creating the image of God need to be loosed from something more severe? So there's two types of people in this world. There's the burden givers and there's the burden takers. I'm going to tell you right now what the Bible affirms. The Bible affirms burden takers. But let's first, let's first talk about the burden givers. Right? Here are people who claim to be spiritual, who have no heart to pity anyone else's plight. They have no eye for the beauty of Christ's compassion on anyone's life. They have no soul to rejoice when someone's delivered and experiencing liberation. They have no ear for the music of anyone's praise about how God's working. The bondage of the ruler was worse than that of the woman. Think about this. Here's the irony. Her bondage affected only her body, but his bondage shackled his soul. Can I tell you why? Because there's only two religions in this world. Some of you are like, that's not what I heard in world religion class at Arizona State University. Break it down. Two, two religions in this world. And all religions will fall into one of two categories. You ready for what those two world religions are in the world? There's the religion of divine accomplishment. Or there's the religion of human achievement. And we're going to make this really easy. There's only one religion that falls into the category of divine accomplishment. And that's Christianity. If, important if, Christ has done it all. Notice, divine accomplishment. He has to do it. Because you don't bring anything to the table. Don't you dare think, well, no, God did 99.9%. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. But God makes you alive in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2. Two types of religion, divine accomplishment or human achievement. How do you know what religion you're following? Well, are you adding burdens to people's lives or are you taking burdens? The gospel of Christ takes burdens. Take my yoke upon you, right? All you who are weary, have you laid, and I will give you rest. Well, that's Jesus, you say. I don't, well, Galatians chapter 6, a little Galatians 6 will be good for you this week. It says, come along those who are weak and struggling and bear their burdens and thus fulfill the law of God. There's people who are trapped in their trespasses and sins. And you who are spiritual, don't boast, don't brag, but carry the burdens. Bear one another burden because the only debt we owe to one another because if you've been loved by Christ, according to Romans chapter 13, verse 8, is this, you owe the debt of love to all people. 
because you've been loved. Show love and bear burdens. If you're not the type of person to take burdens but to give burdens, you're following a religion of human achievement. Because you know why you add burdens to people's lives? To make you look better. As long as I'm ahead of you, as long as I look better than you, guess what? I'm okay. No, you're not. You don't reflect the heart of God at all. Any tradition, any faith, any spirituality, any religion, whatever you want to call it, that keeps you from helping others is not from God. It is not from God. And you can behind, and this is what you do, you hide behind your own set of rules that you've established to make you feel good. But they're not from God, right? You will do whatever it takes to hide behind your religion to avoid love's obligations. You are obligated in a good way to love and to love ferociously. Can I use that word? To love eagerly, to love passionately, to love unequivocally, to love with a love that you claim to have been loved by. Here's what I'm going to tell you right now. Someone's needs will always be more important than your rules and regulations. And the good news is this. Compassion is never illegal. It's never illegal. The person who, and I think about this, right? Like the person who says, hey, I didn't make it to church on Sunday because I came across somebody with a need and I felt like that was more important. I sit there and go. <laughs> sound like, hey, Jerry, where were you Sunday? Because you weren't at church. <laughs> While I was helping somebody, praise God, you fulfilled Love's obligations. You're not going to get mercy. You're like, I just had to sleep in. No, 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 no. <laughs> Either you're out loving somebody and lifting burdens or you're here worshiping with the community. Yeah. There's no middle. I don't care who's playing <laughs> in the football game. <laughs> I don't care how tired you are. Jesus rose from the dead and you can't get out of bed. Are you kidding me? <laughs> really? So we are going to be burden takers. Galatians chapter 6, Romans chapter 13, right? Here's Jesus' point. I love how Jesus just, he takes the, the law and he is the perfect fulfillment of the law, right? Love God, love others. That's, that's the law. Love God, love others. Not two separate points, but two points that work in perfect harmony and unity with each other. Love God, love others. If Animals can receive basic care on the Sabbath. How much more will human beings be deserving of this kind of care? Especially a woman of promise, a child of Abraham. Now, I love what Jesus does here. Because he's very key and intentional on restoring this woman's dignity in a culture that demean women. He showcases not only God's power to heal this woman, but he also labels, identifies, gives her a title. She is a fellow heir of grace. She is a child of Abraham. And don't you dare treat her any less significantly. This is awesome. I love it. Jesus loves the oppressed. He loves the outcast. He loves the, the demeaned, right? Because he wants to liberate them and remove all the burdens. That not only are self-imposed, but are also societal imposed. This is this woman's day of deliverance. And I, and I will tell you, when it comes to deliverance, God promises you all who believe in Jesus, you will be delivered from those things that pain you. But the problem is we don't know when. But whether he does it today or not, you're still going to glorify him. Whether he does it tomorrow or not, you're still going to glorify him. Because here's the guarantee. One day we will all be delivered. Because Revelation says there's a place with him for eternity where he can, he's going to wipe away every single tear. He's going to take every pain. There's not going to be sin. There's not going to be disease. There's not going to be political parties. Amen. <laughs> there's not going to be battle over vaccines. Amen. <laughs> There's not going to be fighting with family and neighbors. There's going to be a place for God 
will remind us of what's truly important. That is a love and a grace and a mercy that has been supplied by him and sustained by him. Your day of deliverance is coming. My day of deliverance is coming. I don't know when, but it's, it's promised. Why? Because all who believe are children of Abraham. Every promise, every blessing that has come through Abraham for those who believe, according to Paul, who have had the circumcision of the heart, the work of God done on that internal part of who we are, you are heirs of that promise. And because of that, we're going to believe all things, amen? We're going to hope all things, amen? We're going to help all people, amen? We're going to pray for all things. How dare we say, God can work any other day, but he's not going to work today. I'm going to believe today. And I'm going to believe like crazy, and I'm going to hope like crazy. Because that's what love does. It honors people, and it includes people, no matter how badly they're bent over, no matter how bad they're struggling with sin. Today is the perfect day to reveal God's power to heal and to reveal Satan's impotent power to destroy. We just need to take away all the, the facades and the veneers we put up, thinking like, if someone truly knew who I was deep down inside, they'd never love me. The church of Christ needs to be different. God has seen me in my wretchedness. And he still goes, I want you. I'm like, really? <laughs> That's the kind of love we need to share with each other. And especially during times like this. Right? Times when we're just all like locked up and secluded and, and just... Our diet is social media, a horrible diet. That's why we're going to talk about this at Questions Cafe. How do we, how do we have a God-honoring digital citizenship in our world? Because we communicate a lot that way. But you know, we're going to be burden takers. We're going to bear one another's burdens, whatever it means. How can I help you? What do you need from me? So there's this 74-year-old guy in Dallas, Texas. Played baseball, high school, college. Became a an engineer, but 74 years old, he, got, he loved baseball even though he grew older and couldn't really play the game. His family had bought him a really nice expensive baseball glove Christmas 2019. Probably with the hopes of 2020 would be a great year to just play with an older guy's team or whatever. COVID hits, lockdowns happen. His wife just this past week has just watched her husband just kind of just deteriorate emotionally, deteriorate just mentally. So she goes to social media and she says, I don't know if anyone's going to read this, but I got a 70-year-old, 74-year-old husband who's in good shape and just wants to throw a baseball around with somebody. <laughs> Would anyone be willing to, to meet and just throw the ball around? Dozens of people responded, how about this park on this day at this time? There's pictures of them. This guy out just throwing the ball. Right? Like, we're not playing a game. We don't need umps and we don't need officials and we don't need a team. We just need to go out and do something that's like, this is cool. This, this is human. This is, this is connection, right? This varied group of strangers come together and they find escape from, from all the turbulence we're all facing just to do something as humans as to connect. Here's the question. You probably have someone in your life that is burdened. The question is, when will you help alleviate that burden? When will you come along someone, someone and just be like, you want to go for a beer? You want to go for a hike? You just want to sit and look at each other? Because looking at each other is better than me looking at a wall. <laughs> right? Just do something. There is no reason that these seasons in life have to strip us of our humanity. If evermore, we need to be ever attentive to hear how people are hurting and what people need, because if God has brought someone into your life that has a burden, I believe you're positioned in their life to help take that burden or alleviate it to a degree. 
Here's what I don't want. I don't want you to be like the, the religious leaders who are humiliated by Christ because they didn't do what they knew they needed to be doing. And I do know that when you do this with another human being, there are going to be people that rejoice because they see love's obligations being played out in your life. And I do know that the, like the woman, when you experience the freeing grace of God in your heart, you, you glorify him. Right? That's the goal, is, right? is to, to walk with God and to realize, like, he's done something amazing for me. And he continues to do things that are amazing for me. And I think that people rejoice because they finally heard a message that rang true with their spirits that said, yes, God is a God who doesn't add to burdens, but he bears our burdens. They rejoice because there was someone named Jesus who stood up for them. Whose burdens will you help alleviate today? Some of you are like, well, my schedule's pretty full today. All right, let me ask you another question. Whose burdens are you going to fulfill or lift tomorrow, or alleviate tomorrow? What about Tuesday? Now you're thinking to yourself, but what about my burden? Here's the answer. And I can't explain it. You only have to experience it for yourself. There's an amazing work of God that happens when you think of others as more important than yourselves. You end up getting your burdens taken care of as a result of you helping someone else and their burdens. I don't know how it works. It works. (laughs) Philippians chapter 2. Consider others as more important than yourselves. Because this is the way of Jesus. And somehow, some way, God is going to fill your spirit. He's going to restore your soul. He's going to meet you where you are hurting in the very act or maybe after of you helping somebody in their burdens. And it's interesting now, we're going to switch this, we'll close to this last point. There's a growing hope. See, here's the good news is as God is continually bringing about liberating healing, as he's continuing to condemn hypocrisy, there's a growing hope. And this is why Jesus gives us two short parables. Because he wants you to understand something about what he's just done. The kingdom of God is breaking into our world. Today. January 17th, 2021. The kingdom of God is still breaking into our world. And more importantly, it's breaking into our hearts. And here's what you need to see in these parables. When the kingdom of God breaks in, it loosens Satan's grips. It it straightens out what sin is bent. It frees us from the bonds of legalism. And what's so cool is that this release and this restoration takes place in the insignificant, unnamed places. That's where the small triumphs of the gospel happen. Here's Here's what I'm totally encouraged by. There's a small triumph happening for the kingdom of God in a place called Sozo Coffee in a town called Chandler, Arizona. Because here's how God doesn't measure success by numbers. He measures success by what's going on the inside that's unseen to our eyes. Notice the parables. You can categorize them in these two ways. Number one, the kingdom and its extending presence. God does his best work in the uh, obscure, unimportant places. That's what excites the heart of God. Right? These are the places where, that make an impact for eternity. There may be other ministries, which we're, we praise God for, that have all the bells and whistles and the fog machine, because the fog machine, you, you know when the Holy Spirit shows up is when the fog machine's released. And, and they got the flying Jesuses and the crosses, and they got the pastor who's tatted, right, who, who shows everybody, hey, I've got a history and a past and, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, maybe they don't have a pastor who blows their nose like, that, like I did earlier. And, that, and that's okay. That's how comfortable I feel with you guys, right? And uh, maybe, you know, scratching himself, right? And I have no excuse for this. Connor does. I don't. But, you know, here's the reality of it is that when God works, he often works in the ob- obscure, unimportant places where there's small triumphs for the kingdom going on. And maybe God's working here more than he's working anywhere else in the world right now. I don't want to be boastful or prideful to say that, but a lot of people will measure by what they see, the externals, and that's not how God works, right? It's like a mustard seed, Jesus says. It's, it's outward, it's upward. Christ will build his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the smallest of seeds eventually grows into a tree where birds find their home. 
See, God is doing a work here where he's growing this tree, this spiritual tree, where people are finding their home. There's a place of rest. There's a place of, of restoration. Yes, what is insignificant at its beginning begins to have immense importance. Why? Because the seed, the size of the seed is not important, but the impact of it is. The kingdom is reaching people and nations, and people are finding their rest. Parable number one. Second parable is this. It's the kingdom's transforming power. And like yeast, which when it's worked into the dough, you don't see it. It is unknown how that yeast is working, but it is working. And this is how God's gospel works. It works inward and through. While we're excited about the outward and upward, we're more excited about what it's doing because the kingdom of God is not about nations, it's not about buildings, it's not about kingdom small k, it's about the work of God in every single individual man and woman's heart. See, kingdoms of the world grow by external force. Christ's kingdom works internally through individual lives. What? Just like the woman bent over, experienced, right? There's a silent, unseen work of God that begins to affect everything in and through us. The power to change, don't miss this, always starts and comes from the inside. The power to change your life your marriage, your family, your community, your nation, your world always comes from the inside. And it's when the work of God is combined with the word of God that incredible transforming power happens. And all I can say in closing is this. Listen to his voice. Obey his voice. Surrender to his voice. And watch what God's going to do. Because the greatest question we could probably ask each other as we grow in hope, because this is what the gospel does, it, hel help, it allows us to grow in hope. Is not what do you think about the president? What do you think about the vaccine? What do you, here's, how is the gospel of hope growing in your heart? There's no more important question to ask. Why? Because only the gospel that grows in people's hearts is a gospel worth living for and being preoccupied with. And nothing else is important. And all God's people said, good news isn't it i love it let's stand let's pray father thanks for giving us time to to be with one another this morning and uh this is this is a time that we should uh not treat trivially we should not treat lightly we should tr not treat as unimportant but lord such a unique gathering lord that you have notched out in in, in our schedules to say it is important to come together to focus upon you and to be reminded of who you are and how you work, but also to be aware of one another. To be aware of one another's victories and struggles. Lord, to, to rejoice with those who rejoice, to weep with those who weep. Lord, show us what it means to fulfill love's obligations in one another's lives. Lord, may we be truly a community of believers that the world would know we're your disciples because of our love for one another. And not only helping one another live in the liberating, freeing power of the gospel, but to help others who are not a part of this community be a part. Lord, because there's nothing like being a part of Jesus' family. Help us lead others to that truth. Help us to continue to grow and, and be continually freed and liberated from the things that want to just ensnare us and, and shackle us. Thank you, Father.
that you love us perfectly and permanently. That's awesome. You're awesome, Father. Thank you for all that you've given us in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day, you guys. Love you.